one good podcast about that. Just go search How to Fuck Up an Airport. It's a really good podcast. It's how Germany really screwed up the German airport. Um, so I'm going to talk about the past, present, and the future of the Cosmos SDK. Kind of give a high-level overview. I'm going to try and stay out of the weeds, just because I don't know how technical the crowd is, and so just a heads up there. Um, so a bit about me. I'm the Cosmos SDK lead. Um, I work on the Cosmos SDK day in, day out. Um, I first started as a developer relations engineer in AIB, um, in Tendermint and Dink. And then I worked on Tendermint and Common BFT for about two years. And that has kind of led me to being in Cosmos for about five years. Um, so recently, in 2023, uh, owner uh, Akapolat and I founded Binary Builders. And what we do is we do the uh, Builders program, the Cosmos SDK, and Numia, which is data analytics platform. Uh, my wife works at Poked Up. Uh, thankfully, she's on the marketing side, so we don't have technical talks at home. She usually meets on the marketing side, and I usually will have the technical conversations. I'm Croatian American. I love boating, love pets, and love my dog. Many of you know him, um, and just love sports. So, the agenda of the talk is the past, the present, and the future. So, starting in the past, yeah, starting in the past, we have Bitcoin. So, we're going down a bit, of, we're going down memory lane a bit. We have Bitcoin. It came out. And all of a sudden, we had this like digital currency that people could come, and it's verifiable, it's usable. And then a bunch of forks started showing up. We have Dogecoin, we have Litecoin, we have all these things that fork the code base and make a little tweak to the consensus or to the economics and launch, and all of a sudden it's a new thing. Soon after that, it wasn't a fork, but Ethereum came. And then we had a bunch of forks from Ethereum, from that one code base get, we all know like the history of Tron, the history of all these different code bases that emerged from this Go Ethereum code base that was the start of this larger ecosystem. But they were all isolated. They were there was no way to communicate with them. Well, you could go through uh, you could go through centralized exchanges to communicate, but then everything would be tracked. And back then, of course, like the centralized exchanges weren't as secure and weren't as trustworthy as today. And so you really had no way. If it, was, if it was either you were on Bitcoin and you were doing stuff there, and if you're willing to take the risk to go through an exchange, then you could go to Ethereum. But otherwise, there wasn't much out there. And that's where Jay Kwan and Ethan Buckman really came to the vision of Cosmos. Um, I believe Bucky talked about it earlier in his talk today about this app chain thesis. And through this app chain thesis, IPC, Cosmos SDK, and Tendermint, now known as Comic BFT, came to fruition. A world where this framework that anyone can use to build a blockchain, and that blockchains are not isolated anymore, this really came to fruition, and now we're seeing it in the wild. But you can also see that that vision was so far ahead that it took Cosmos a while to get the lift off. And now we're seeing even the Ethereum people going to the app chain thesis, and they're starting to even ask the Cosmos ecosystem, like, hey, how are you guys solving all this fragmentation that you, we will potentially see coming to the Ethereum ecosystem? Just because we've been dealing with it for a number of years. So, yes, so the Cosmos SDK, it was first released in 2017. There was a few things back before then. There was uh, things like Basecoin that was part of Comet, uh, part of Tendermint. But it really stood the test of time. The Cosmos Hub launched in 2019, the first slash second uh, Cosmos SDK to uh, change to go mainnet. And we kind of removed the Amino. Um, if you know Amino, uh, you know some history there, then you'll probably get a little laugh out of this. We always have to bring it up. But the modularity of the Cosmos SDK, of the entire interchange stack, was a bit half-baked. We were thinking of, okay, how can you replace X with Y? But we weren't really allowing the user to do it in a seamless way. And so this is where, this is where we're kind of going in now. So, yeah, next slide. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so where are we, where are we today? So, like I mentioned, the Cosmos SDK is one of, if not most used, uh, software 
development kit to develop blockchains. Not only blockchains, but it's starting to be used for things like rollups. And we're starting to explore the world of ZK, of ZK rollups. The interesting thing here is we don't really define what a module is or how to interact with the Cosmos SDK. We really define a simple interface of saying, hey, what is what what EM do you want to use? Do you want to use EVM? Do you want to use Solana, uh, the SVM, the Agoric VM, Cosmosm? We define these simple things to allow you to do really whatever you want. And it's a very powerful thing. It is kind of a double-edged sword because we are allowing users to do a lot more than you can do in a simple virtual machine. The, u the user flow today, I mean, DYDX is the perfect example of, in my opinion, what the correct user flow of someone going from a smart contract, gaining user adoption, going to a rollup, and then coming and getting their own sovereignty. That is the ideal scenario, but it is very hard because we do lack the one thing that DYDX has even succeeded at, but many others don't. Users. The wider blockchain ecosystem lacks users, and because of that, there's not a need for a high throughput chain. There's very few needs for it. But, like I mentioned, we're, 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 you can swap these core components. Performance in the Cosmos SDK is somewhat of a bottleneck, but for the most, for 90% of users today, it's good enough. It is solving the, solving the needs of our current user base. The, uh, the iteration speed. So early on in, um, I believe, what was it, 2019, the interchain conversations, when Cosmos was born with Aaron from Region and uh, Ethan Fry from Confio, this early adaptation of a VM for the Cosmos SDK allowed developers to really iterate faster. We all know the bottleneck of developing a chain, launching a validator set, and then doing a coordinated upgrade, that is a lot of work. You basically have to hire another person just to do that level of coordination. Well, Cosmos came in and said, hey, you don't have to do it, but you also don't have to write Solidity. We know we all kind of love Solidity. It's just kind of like that, uh, that neighbor that never really goes away. Um, and, but it's a way better, way better way to iterate on your application in, in breakneck speeds without having to have this extra coordination of the validator set. And like I touched on, this, the upgrade system in the SDK is somewhat cumbersome. Like, we have to admit it, like, the coordination aspect is hard. There isn't an easy way to put it. And then, next slide. But, even with, even with all, some of those bottlenecks, with some of those with those cumbersome upgrades, it is still used by over 50 plus chains. It secures hundreds of millions of dollars. It comes with IPC out of the box that Composable mentioned, like a big reason why they are in the Cosmos ecosystem is IBC is already here. But they, are, but we are bringing IBC to a wider ecosystem. We are the IBC team wants to generalize IBC away from the Cosmos SDK, and we want to enable that for them to be able to use the IBC implementation in a wider range of implementations and of protocols. Tendermint, it's, it's proven. Common BFT, Tendermint consensus, it is proven. It has stood the test of time. I believe it was in 2014 when the first implementation started on Tendermint. And back then, the work then still works today and is still one of the most performant block, uh, consensus protocols out there. Now, there's a few people, if you ask, that they will say that it all, everything is Tendermint and blockchain. Everything started from Tendermint, and then everything after that is just a very, is with Tendermint with a few extra steps. Us in Cosmos, we do love to say that just because it is uh, near and dear to our hearts. But where are we going after this? What is next? So what do we want to do next in the SDK? Well, we want to, these bottlenecks and these cumbersome things, we want to allow, we want to lift those and allow people to be more performant, work in, work in smaller environments, but also allow people to more easily swap components. So we're working with, in the runtime, next slide. Next slide. Okay. Big step back. So when we think, when we think about the SDK, what we're really talking about 
is the kernel versus apple. So the cosmos is the king when you're writing a module, you're kind of you're writing a kernel module, like you are in the operating system. And so here you're writing something that is super powerful, that is super free, that you can do stuff outside of outside of the gas consumption of a block. This is super powerful, but it is super dangerous. You can run into issues, but then when you want to do things that are more permissionless, like a VM, like EVM, Cosmos module, and stuff like this, this is app level. And so the Cosmos SDK is really focused on this kernel level, which will allow us, which allows developers to build more complex applications, but it also, and it also allows them to build to build complex applications that are fitted to their needs, not only a generalized uh, framework. So now on the runtime side, so now on the runtime side, we, with the Cosmos SDK, we're tied to we're tied to ABCI, we're tied to comment, we're tied to dependent. This isn't a bad thing. Like I mentioned, it is one of the most proven and one of the most performant consensus protocols out there. But there are users. There is this whole new world of rollups emerging. And we want to really play in that world. We really want to work with those users. We want to allow people to use different Merkle trees, different consensus engines, different mempools, write more complex and unique pieces of code for the application instead of having this generalized thing. Because our assumptions are not the same assumptions that you might want to make. And so here, we're working with a plethora of teams. Just this is just three that uh, that I'm naming here. Rollkit. Rollkit is a rollup framework to develop uh, that is an alternative to comment to underneath SDK or underneath of generalized VMs in order to uh, do rollups. And so they're also written in Golang. We work seamlessly with them, and we're working quite closely with them on the areas like fraud proofs, validity proofs in this whole world that is emerging. And then we have Barachain. Barachain is really pushing the modularity aspect of the Cosmos SDK today. They're really pushing it to the brink, and, and we are making changes in order to accommodate them, but we want to do this refactor that would allow them to build stuff and treat the Cosmos SDK as a middleware. So with Polaris, it is, or Barachain, is going to be an EVM-based chain. But they have this grand vision of having L2s uh, as part of their L uh, as part of their L1, and in that vision, they want that value to feed back into their main chain with Polaris. We all know Celestia. If we haven't heard about Celestia and Cosmos, then we might be living under a rock. Um, but Celestia is really pushing on how on what they want to do with the software. They're really changing things that they need, they don't want something that's generalized for their for everyone's use case, they want something that is specific to their use case, and so they're making modifications in order to enable that. And we are and will see, rework the SDK in order to make this easier, to make it more seamless, to make it easier to work with the Cosmos SDK in order to build your unique software. And then next, on storage and performance. So this has been a really hot topic in, in crypto. And recently with, I believe it was GAF uh, 113, they redid their entire, uh, they redid their entire key structure for their Merkle tree. That key structure is actually very similar to the key structure that we actually just did in our IDL, uh, in our new keys, in our new Merkle tree that will be released as part of the next release of SDK. But as part of this story of performance work, Cosmos and blockchains in general have this problem of state load. It is a large issue and we want to be able to solve it, we want to be able to provide alternatives than what there is today. Today it's like there is a Merkle tree, you store everything there. If you want to run an archive node, well, you have to store it all in the Merkle tree. There's a plethora of different ways to do this storage. Also, it's really honing in on the question of, okay, in the early days of blockchain, we had this requirement that all states have to be provable. All states have to be verifiable as far back as we can go. Well, there's teams that started questioning this. Like Solana, Solana, I don't believe like their Genesis block is provable because it's so far back, their state is so large. So it's really starting to question these norms, these things we accepted early on in crypto, 
and starting to reevaluate in order to give a better UX to users, to node operators, but also be more performant. Like the Web three, the Web two world solved these issues many times over, and it feels like we're recreating the wheel in many of these sort of solutions. And so we're really honing in on what is Web two doing? Why are we doing that? What is the missing aspect in crypto from Web two? And trying to bring, and trying to bridge that gap. Next slide. So cross lane. So blockchain people are obsessed with Rust. It's everything Rust. Not even JavaScript. Not even C anymore. It's all just Rust. The Cosmos SDK is written in Go, and when it was written in 2017, the state of Rust was very, very poor. It was it was breaking. 1.0 wasn't released, and so Go was decided. As the, frame, as the language of choice. Now years have passed. Rust is an amazing language. We all love it, even the people, even I, who writes Go all the time. Um, of course, I mean, I work in blockchain, but can't you love Rust? And we want to be able to en enable users to write modules in different languages to not limit them to have to write Go language. Like, there are a lot of teams that come to us and just say, hey, like, I would love to write with the Cosmos SDK. It has everything we it has the modularity, but my team isn't a Go team. Can you help us find a team that can write Go for us? And then it's a limited amount of people because the Cosmos ecosystem is fairly small. And so we, we, need to either, we need to either help the team get trained on how to write Cosmos SDK, how to write Go, or they outsource it, or they go to a different framework. And so allowing people to build in Rust also enables different ways to compile the code. So now we've been playing with, we've been talking with different users, with different uh, also frameworks like Substrate, about RISC-V in that whole world. RISC-V is a really new emerging technology that really came to light a couple of years ago, and now it's really being pushed. Now, I'm of the opinion that Watson was our stepping stone and RISC-V is our, is our final destination, and so now we're really starting to see that. And so I'm really hoping that we can really start pushing the boundary with risc -5. We're fairly close with the Substrate team, and they just announced their Polka VM, which is a risc -5 VM, and so we've been talking to them a bit about how they're thinking about it and really trying to hone in. But this also solves a different, a different problem. <laughs> but this also, okay, I'm gonna go fast. <laughs> this also solves a different problem, upgrades. This allows us to do more seamless upgrades. Nodes don't have to upgrade on the, on the dock at the height they can upgrade before, they can upgrade more dynamically without having to either go through governance or uh, a blob is uploaded and then the chain is upgraded. Next slide. And then ZK. So, like I mentioned, ZK fraud proofs, although they are different, this, this state machine and the proving capabilities need to be somewhat similar in order to get there. And so we are exploring with RISC-V, Wasm, and these different worlds on how to get the Cosmos SDK, its modules, its business logic, to compile down to environments where we can more seamlessly verify with fraud proofs, we can build execution by clients or IBC in order to communicate with pull-ups and stuff like that. Next, UX. I'm um, just going to go quickly. So all this really leads back to UX from the node operators to the application developers, and then also to the users. These are the three main people where these, this, these technology improvements will really lead back to and will really help. Since I only think I have a minute, um, I just wanted to say a quick shout out to everyone who's been helping out on the Cosmos SDK, the Cosmos SDK while we are the core maintainers. It is built with a plethora of people, and it's not only us building it, it's a, it's a whole ecosystem of teams. And if your logo isn't up there, this is just a few of the teams that are helping, but there's a plethora of people working on it weekly and then on a daily basis. And if you want to reach out to talk about RISC-5, talk about the Cosmos SDK, talk about the roadmap or anything, just reach out and we can chat. I'm here till Thursday, and I think I'm good on time.